Good morning, everyone. I'm Tim Regan with Senior Housing News, and welcome to our SHN Sales Summit. Um, today, tomorrow and Friday, you'll be hearing from leading providers and industry partners on really all things sales. And I think we're starting off our event strong this morning with a panel on something that I know I'm curious about, and I know other folks in the industry are also curious about, which is selling what the senior living industry really wants. And that is a challenge, even when we don't have a pandemic going on. So, you know, again, if you're in senior living sales, I think that you know how much of the job is managing leads, giving tours, marketing information or products to prospects, uh, or I should say people. <laughs> sales teams have quotas, uh, but it's worth asking, do these intentions best meet the needs of the market? You know, people are still dealing with fear, ambivalence, confusion, and in some cases they are undergoing a crisis. And so today we're gonna learn how uh, sellers and sales teams need to be sensitive to that. So joining us today, we've got Alex Fisher. Alex is the president and co-founder of Sherpa, which is a St. Louis-based firm that offers a sales enablement platform providing methodology, CRM technology, and sales analytics to the senior living industry. We also have Casey Jackson. Casey is the executive director of the Institute for Individual and Organizational Change, which provides training and guidance in evidence-based motivational interviewing. So welcome to our panelists. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, I want to again thank our thought leadership sponsors, which are Sherpa, Conversion Logics, and Point Click Care. I also want to thank our awareness sponsors, Caring.com, The Vector, and Gemini Advanced Marketing Solutions. And finally, uh, you can participate with us as we go along. You should see that you've got a Q&A window on Zoom. Um, you can type questions in there and please do so. Um, you know, I always like to say this is a collaborative discussion and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today. I also uh, wanted to remind you that if you miss uh, today's session or any of the sessions this week, the recordings are gonna be posted at the conclusion of the event and they're gonna be available for 30 days. Also, Casey will be only joining us for the first half of our discussion. So if you have any questions for him today, make sure you get those in sooner rather than later. So, all right, <laughs> with all of that out of the way, um, Alex, jump right into Hi. it. Let's start off. Hi, good time. morning. Good morning, everyone. We have so much content to jump pack. So just a caveat, be, um, you're going to have a lot of new concepts maybe that you'll be exposed to. So just be patient with yourselves and it's going to take some time to absorb. Um, but really, we're really excited about, well, first of all, um, Casey is an incredible inspiration to me. Uh, I've always been struggling whether with whether or not selling is the right word for what we do um, and what it is that we are selling. So um, I really wanted to, to bring him in to, to discuss, um, you know, for him to share uh, his knowledge. Um, what are we selling, <laughs> you know? Um, so institutionally, let me see if I figure out how to, uh, sorry, institutionally, our industry has been born out of this um, idea of providing shelter and care for individuals. It was born out of the skilled nursing industry where older adults uh, that needed shelter, care, support uh, came to. And not, a lot has changed since then. A lot has changed in a, the way we build our buildings, in the way we um, in the way we do lifestyle and amenities and et cetera, et cetera. So, what hasn't really changed very much is, is the way we sell, uh, the way we, um, we look for prospects and for prospective residents and the way we try to close them. And by that, I mean that it seems like we are really focused on that 5% of our market or of our lead base that are ready to, um, to go. They have some urgency, they need care, they need shelter, they can't stay at home any longer but 90% of the market are ambivalent about whether or not they would leave their home, when, whether, um, and why. So there's a lot of that, as, as Tim mentioned at the beginning. So I think that what people really are looking for is the place of belonging, a place where they can preserve their identity and they can find belonging so that they can spend the remainder of their lives in a community that sees them, that uh, values them. So without further ado, I just wanna say that 
Casey had an incredible presentation at, at MPEF last um, December. God, it's been, it's been forever. And some of the key lessons that we took away from us meeting together and figuring out what is it that we can do for our market? What are we selling? And for those, for those particular reasons, we realized that we discussed the need for practical empathy, the need to be remarkable. How do we become remarkable? How do we become more empathic? How do we act with more urgency? Not finding urgency in our market, but us being more urgent about the enormous task that we have to provide happiness and long life for our, for our market, for our residents, for our potential residents. And then um, what is required in terms of imagination and curiosity. And institutionally, we have been um, educated to know things, not to be curious about things. We go to school and we are, we are asked for our expertise or for our knowledge, and that's how we're gauged. And um, so we're trying to, we're trying to um, throw some light as to whether or not that's a good practice for our lives and for our work. So without further ado, I am letting, um, I'm going to let um, Casey go. Go Casey, go. All right. So when you're talking about imagination, <laughs> Alex, one of the things about thinking outside the box is I am not from the senior living industry. I'm way outside of the box with that. Um, my background's in mental health and substance use and working with families and, and people that have been incarcerated. So that's quite a ways outside of the, out of, out of the senior living industry. I spent 16 years at Washington State University in an institute studying behavior and behavior change. And specifically one method of communication that helps people with significant issues resolve ambivalence. And that's when I ran across uh, David and Alex, um, you know, as they were exploring different things and evidence and, and what was trending in um, evidence-based practices. That's when I started meeting up and having conversations. And the thing that I get fascinated about when we're working with human beings is I studied a lot on trauma and stress. So when we talk about pre-COVID, we talk about you know, being in the throes of COVID, there's just stress on the brain. And when we're stressed, we go into fight, flight, and freeze mode. And what people tend to want to do is rescue or sell or push or coax or coerce, um, find ways to engage people in a change process to resolve ambivalence. And the metrics around it shows that that does not work. It actually can exacerbate situations. So the thing that I always get fascinated with, with populations that I serve or work with, and what I look with with older adults as well too, is we know some basic physics around human behavior change. We know cross-culturally, human beings want their behavior to be aligned with what their values and their goals are. We, we wanna be in alignment with that. If you tell me that you have a high level of integrity, if you tell me that you always show people respect. And then if I rewind your entire life for the last two months, and I say, wait a second, what about this? You post it on social media. Is that have integrity? Does that show respect? As soon as we get caught or we catch ourselves, the first things we do is we either blame outside of ourselves or we make an excuse. And when we make excuses, that means we're internal, which means there's ambivalence there. If we're blaming outside of ourselves, that's resistance, energy between two things. What, what fascinates me about human dynamics, and when you're looking at the human brain, when you're trying to help them resolve ambivalence, is when we tend to push, we tend to generate resistance. It, when you study these things, what's fascinating is, according to physics, there is no such thing as a resistant individual. There's no such thing as a resistant spouse to an older adult. There's no such thing as a, as a resistant adult child. There's her physics, no human being, no one human being is resistant, even in the addiction world. They're not resistant. The way you think about this, when you look at physics is if I picked up a rubber band, how much resistance is in a rubber band? None, until what? Right, until what? Until we pull on it. Every time you open your mouth in any conversation, personally or professionally, 
you can increase tension or you can reduce tension. And, and this is what's fascinating. So according to physics, this is resistance. We can measure this, or this is resistance. But resistance requires two things, which means what you have is people that are ambivalent. If you have an ambivalent person who's struggling to make a decision and someone steps into the equation with a thought or an opinion, the energy can shift this direction. And as soon as, as, soon as it shifts this direction, now you've got resistance where there was ambivalence. And this is the 90% that Alex was talking about of do I or do I not? Should I or shouldn't I make these moves? And, and the more that you have adult children pushing, the more that you have a whole wave of community salespeople trying to be the most favored status nation, the more that's generating resistance, which means it's not being of service. You're strengthening a defense mechanism within somebody's brain, which means you get the calls like, no, honey, I'm not really interested. Uh, well, maybe at some other time, if things get worse, or all these excuses or blaming outside of the self. This is, this is just physics. This is just physics of communication or human communication. And so what's fascinating about this, I'm gonna pop up a couple of screens just for the, the visual learners here. There is specific methods to convert resistance to ambivalence. The tension between two things where there's no way there's gonna be a win-win when there's tension between two things. And what we can do in short order, this is why I get obsessed with evidence-based practices and fidelity, is like when I work with law enforcement, I've got videos where there is significant amount of resistance. So incredible amounts of resistance. And within less than three minutes, they already have generated ambivalence instead of resistance mm -hmm. through communication. Because the one thing we do have control over is what comes out of our mouth. That's what we have control over. We don't have control over how they think. You can try to feature dump, you can try to educate, you can try to provide information. And that doesn't unstress the brain. That actually increases stress to the brain. And, and this is what's so fascinating about it is when you look from a physics perspective, the picture would shift. Because if I just pop up the picture and say, hey, where do you see resistance in this picture? The majority of people will say, well, with the donkey. If I ask a physicist where she sees the resistance here, she said, well, I can measure it between the kid's shoulder and the donkey's butt. I can put a mechanism in there and measure the pressure point right there. And so what happens, which is difficult in the world you work in is the more attached you get to an outcome, the more you push, the more you're facilitating resistance. Because the irony is in this picture, the irony is if the kid just stood up and took two steps back, the donkey's head swings forward. And as soon as you step up and start pushing again, the donkey starts to push back. So this is just, this is basic physics in dialogue or communication. And this is really difficult for people because we do get attached to other people's outcomes. But the science and the research around it is pretty clear. When you're generating stress in someone, they cannot get into their prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is where our decision-making, our good decision-making comes from. Our entire cortex of our brain is where the executive functioning is, the CEO of our brain that makes good decisions. And the more stress that happens, the more that the brain cannot go up into the cortex. It actually goes into the primal brain and the survival brain. So now you take a pandemic on top of that, where people are chronically, you yourself have low levels of chronic stress on a day-to-day -day basis that you've never experienced before, which means sometimes you're not making always the best decisions or the decisions you're making are more survival decisions. I'm not gonna meet with people in person. That makes me too nervous. Or I'm not gonna do this or I can't do this. We shift into survival mode. But for some reason, we think that if we give somebody enough education or information that they will actually change their behavior. And when we see on a national level, that doesn't work. So when you're working with an individual, an older adult who already has a low level of stress, then add a pandemic on top of it, then you add somebody who's bringing them muffins every other week, saying that I'm your friend, will you listen to me and talk to me because I've got some great things that I think will help you. That does not engage the, the cortex. 
it doesn't engage decision making in that process. So one of the things that's fascinating to me, because these are, these are things that I like to study, is at one point I'd heard there's a, there's a specific method that I teach. Um, so there's a it's an evidence based practice of communication that was born out of the addiction world. It spread into mental health. It's used in healthcare now, all sorts of different fields. And there's been some people in senior living that have kind of explored using it. It's called motivational interviewing. And all it is, it's just a method of communication. And so I'm, I'm always kind of reading research articles. There's over 5,000 research articles on this method of communication internationally. Since 1984, there's just massive amounts of research about human behavior and change in communication. And so this is this theory that I get obsessed with. And it was probably a few years ago, I see this, I literally it was on one of the ticker tapes on CNN and it said, um, robots are, out, are able to better do counseling and this method of communication robots are better at it than human beings. And I'm like, this is just not possible. It's, there's just no way. Um, but it was a research article. So I pull up the research article. And this was really fascinating. So people who were struggling with any personal issue, there's the, these robots were programmed and you would just tap it on the head when you wanted a response. And when people were exiting this and they could talk about whatever they needed to, whatever their stress or their struggle was and help them resolve their own ambivalence. And people just really appreciated this, this research study. They really appreciated the interaction with the robots. And I'm like, this just can't be true. So I'm reading through the data. This is what's really fascinating. That's where I get excited about these kind of geeky things is it wasn't that the robots were better at motivational interviewing because I was looking at it and what the robots were doing were not motivational interviewing. What they were doing is they were just giving a supportive statement. And what the conclusion of it was, it's because the reason the people liked it so much is because they were perceived as not being judgmental or being attached to their outcome. That was the conclusion. They were able to talk about what they needed to out loud and they didn't feel like they were being judged or pushed. So it had nothing to do with what they were doing the actual model better it's they didn't feel anybody had their fingerprints all over them trying to push them into a decision, which generates what? It generates resistance. So this is the last thing I wanted to kind of to wrap up with my side and hand it back to Alex, or if there's any questions before I bow out, is part of the things that I started to study was the difference between empathy, sympathy, and compassion. And these are distinctly different mechanisms. Sympathy is how we feel, what reactions we're having internally about someone else's situation. Empathy is how they feel about their situation. And compassion is that thing inside of us that wells up that makes us wanna change our corner of the world for the better. You can have people that are sympathetic that maybe don't show a lot of compassion or people that are compassionate that don't have sympathy. You can have people that are empathetic and one of the examples that has been the, we talked about in the research world is you can have a used car salesman who can know how to really express empathy accurately. They know how the person feels and thinks and they listen deeply to them, but they may not try to be making the world a better place. They just want to sell. Mm. And so the core mechanisms of effective communication have to do with empathy and compassion. And the irony here is, and again, this is from somebody that works in the, the therapy field or the, the clinical field, is what we've been trained to do. And many of you have been trained in good communication classes, how to do reflective listening. And here's the irony. This is just fascinating to me when you study language. What people were trained to do and are to this day are still trained to do when you use a reflective statement. And I, and I, I bet more than half of you have been trained this way if you've ever took a communication class on listening or active listening is to use statements like what I hear you saying, or it sounds like. And the irony is if I'm talking to Alex, I want you to think which one sounds the most empathetic. If I say, well, Alex, what I hear you saying is you've been struggling lately. Or Alex, it sounds like to me you've been struggling lately. Or Alex, you've really been struggling lately. <laughs> the first two are self-centered statement. What I hear you saying is a self-centered statement. It sounds like to me is a self-centered statement. Empathy by nature is other person centered. So instead of pretending like we're listening 
or let him know that we're listening, you have to be actively involved in what's going on in the other person's experience. What is really going on inside of their reality? And when people feel heard and understood and not judged, they will start to share their dilemma. So this is where the depth of empathy, people can feel, there's measures around this and metrics around this, people can feel when you have a secondary agenda or a primary agenda. So you can sit there biding your time, listening about Fluffy and listening about you know, what they did in during the Vietnam War. You can do all these different things and listen. It doesn't mean they can't feel that you're waiting to get your turn and start to push an agenda. People can feel it, which means that's not complete accurate empathy. Empathy is being present. The thing that's also fascinating about this method is we know when to shift language because you can stay in empathy all day long and it doesn't mean somebody resolves their ambivalence. It just means they share more and more and more and more and more. And so what do we try to do? We try to build better and better and better and better relationships. And this is why relationship sales was so hot for so long and still is. But relationships don't change behavior. If they did, for any of you that are married, your spouse would change behavior because you have a relationship with them. <laughs> or your children would change behavior because you have a relationship with them. Relationships do not change behavior. They do not resolve ambivalence. It's how do you get people really crystal clear, really get in their mind's eye, what are their core values? And when we get clear what our core values are, that's what tips our behavior. There's a, there's a quote from Roy Disney about, you know, once I know what my values are, my decisions become easier. So I'm going to kind of, I'll stop for a moment and see, Tim, are there any questions? I just want to make sure there's an opportunity if there's any questions that popped up. We don't have any questions from the audience at this time, but this would be a good time, Casey, if, if our audience has any questions uh, to submit those now. So I actually do have a question. Maybe Alex, this is one that I can, you can jump in here too. So just in my personal life, you know, I know that there are folks who will say, well, I'm not an empathetic person. I'm not someone who can be sensitive. I'm not a sensitive guy. I, I want results. And that's, that's what I'm focused on. It seems to me though, after listening to you, that you think that empathy is something that can be taught. So what do you say to someone who, you know, going back to your theme about resistance, what do you say to someone who says, okay, well, this might be good if you've got the skills to be empathetic, but that's not me. How, how do you win that person over? Well, it's not about winning anything. All I got to do is look at science and, and, God gave you mirror neurons. Um, we have mirror neurons in our brains. So unless you were born without mirror neurons, then you couldn't express empathy. Or if you have organic brain damage, um, then that could be true. Or you're psychopathic. Psychopathic. Or if you are developing dementia or Alzheimer's, or if you're on the autism spectrum. So if there's a part of your brain that those parts are damaged or not functioning well, then yeah, you probably are low likelihood. There's a difference between desire to be able to express empathy because there's all sorts of things we can get better and better at through practice, but we do have mirror neurons. We can listen differently. We can respond differently. Our, our brain science that it was so amazing about our brain is we can listen so deeply. I can listen to Alex so deeply and, and my, my mirror neurons are turned on that I can actually finish her sentences accurately. If I have no other agenda except for to be present in her space and present in her world and listen through her perspective and listen through her brain. We can train to, to get stronger and stronger with our mirror neurons. Just like we can train our brains to do all sorts of things. When I worked in the prison system, people could train their brains to do all sorts of things to disassociate. So we have incredible capacity. I love what you said, Tim, though, is, but if I have no desire and I just trying to get a sale, yeah, it's not gonna just trigger empathy. And people can trigger themselves out of not having empathy. So there's a difference between, I don't want to go too far in this, but when Alex said, you know, a sociopath, because there's a difference, having this being one of the worlds that I worked in, is there a difference between a sociopath and somebody that's antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder, people that just kind of override their thought process and, and do negative things. Somebody who's sociopathic genuinely doesn't have that part of their brain that's ignited. I think that's, yeah, and people can use empathy to, your, to go back to your car salesman they can use empathy, they could have great skill at empathy, but they don't, um, they, don't, they don't care, they don't feel for that person. And so they use it as a manipulation. Now I got you, and now I'm gonna manipul manipulate you. So the sociopath may have very high cognitive empathy, really understand someone else, 
and then use that for their own. Um, or you can have high emotional empathy and not real cognitive empathy. So, so this is this fascinating. I want to make it my life's work at least this year to help us all in in the work that we do develop that that skill. And in in my next half hour, I'm going to dive into a little bit deeper into some of the thoughts around, you know, oh, I'm not empathic. You know, and Alex, the thing I want to kind of wrap up my section with when you when you say that is what's fascinating to me about that and the same thing tim and weaving in what you brought in as well too is i think if that's what you're doing then please change what you have on your vision statement and your mission statement that you have on your website because if it's just about a sale be honest with the people you're selling to and say it's really not about creating a living environment or quality of life or you know vibrant lifestyles then just stop marketing that and saying, we just need to get heads in beds, um, you know, or just put that as your mission statement. Because if you want it to be about compassion, if you want it to be about a community of people that aren't being coerced or manipulated in there, where the community is miserable with people just having buyer's remorse and how did they trick me into this? It depends what kind of communities you want. And what I love about this whole concept period, irrespective of this field, is, is your behavior in line with what your values are. And if it's just about sales, then be honest about that. Yeah. Casey, I mean, we, we, we that, so. I, I don't want to interrupt you. I know you've got a, a, only a couple more minutes left, but we do have actually a question I think that you can help answer maybe on your way out. Sure. Sure. The question was, and I'm going to read this just as it comes. Does sympathy have a role in relating to seniors or is sympathy all about I statements? So I think that relates to something that you were talking about earlier. Sympathy, always a, sympathy has a role in humanity, period. It doesn't have a role in helping people resolve their own ambivalence. So when you're working with seniors to sympathy, absolutely, it, people need to know that somebody else has feelings and cares about those things. But again, it is those more self-centered, not in a negative way, but more in that self-centered perspective is sympathy. Um, I can't even imagine what you're going through. That must have been so difficult for you. Like I'm just guessing what it feels like to be in your, in your shoes. But this is what you're looking at when you take a step back and just go, this is, there's a primary difference in the expression of empathy and sympathy and what, what it yields in those situations. So that's a great distinct, great distinct. And yes, sympathy is very, it's critical. It's, with seniors, with children, with humans, sympathy is a critical component to human, but it doesn't help resolve ambivalence. Great. Uh, I, I don't know. Do, do, do you have time for another one? Are we actually sure. have another question that you yeah. might great. Okay. So um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll read this one. Um, and so the question is, how do you see IQ and EQ uh, play into the role of salespeople in senior living or really anyone working in the senior living industry? It, for me, it, it, it tips into a little bit, Tim, what you brought up in terms of what part of your brain are you using? And do you have any cognition about what's going on in the other person's brain? You can have high IQ and low EQ, which means there's a lower probability that your brain is going to be able to actually engage another person's brain effectively. Um, you can have high EQ and you're going to engage the other person's brain significantly better because again, it is being able to pick up and perceive the other person. It's You can have high IQ and have Asperger's or be on the autism spectrum. Um, it doesn't mean you can pick up the perspective of other human beings uh, at all or very well at all. So if you're trying to help, and this is why it comes down to what are you trying to affect? And if you're trying to help resolve ambivalence, helping them resolve ambivalence has to be with inside the other person's, what their debate, what their struggle, what the internal dilemma is. From an intellectual perspective, what you wanna do is you tend to wanna to solve it. So you can have high IQ, wanting to solve problems, give information, give education, and that process in and of itself can actually generate more and more resistance. So this is why, again, it, it's that inner relationship, I think is a fascinating, it's a great question, but that's how I distinguish it from a behavior change perspective. Great. Well, Casey, I think you've 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 got a bounce. Um, but really quickly, how we uh, we got a couple more questions. How can people contact you if if, if they want to uh, learn a little bit more? Um, they can. Uh, my email is just casey.jackson at ifioc.com or ifioc. The Institute for Individual and Organizational Change is uh, the company that I'm the director of. So those are the the best places. And then on, on all the things on Instagram and all those things as well too. Cool. Oh. Casey, thanks for coming. Uh, you can ping us at Sherpa, any of us, and we'll get you in touch as well. Excellent. Take care. Casey, Enjoy. my friend, Casey. very, very grateful for you. Thank you. Bye, Alex. Thank you. Bye.
All right. Well, um, that was that was uh, great, Alex. Yeah, I guess you have you have more to share now. I do. I just wanted to sort of um, continue to build on on what Casey said because there's so much packed in there, and uh, I have a few slides only because I cheat and I need it. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen in just a second. And any questions as well? I want to try to make this as as um, as collaborative as possible because it's just me talking now. So. Okay, so wow, there's so much to unpack. You know, one of the things that I think about a lot and, and for this year, what we are trying to accomplish is understand, is, is shifting the way that, um, that we do sales and we do marketing. Um, why are we so marketing driven in our industry? And what is the difference between being marketing driven and being market driven. Um, I think that again, this this idea that we need to generate as many leads as possible so that we can go as quickly as possible through as many of them as possible to find the ones that are ready to go and so that we can sell them. We can sell those people that don't express resistance because they're urgent, right? That's the 5% I was talking about. And so our marketing dollars are spent in trying to find people that are ready to go and that have no ambivalence because solving ambivalence, getting to, into an empathic mode, having conversations takes time. And yet the evidence shows that it yields much better results, much more vibrant communities. So if we were market driven, and by the way, our market, is our lead base. Each one of you that's involved in day-to-day -day sales, just open up your CRM and that's your market. Being market-driven means striving to understand the people in our lead base. What are they thinking? How do they think? What are they, what is their ambivalence coming from? And we get in the way of that process by not, not it's not that we don't care, we just don't have the time to even invest in having those kinds of conversations in which we can understand our market. So the goal is, or what about if we actually changed our view in senior living of our market and really decide that we're gonna really listen so that then we can um, help that person achieve or be in balance between what they value and their current living situation. People don't inquire unless what they value in life, their social involvement, the way that they see people, the way they relate to their families, their roles, et cetera. If what their value is no longer congruent with how they live, they will be seeking out a change and they will be calling you. But you have a lot of leads to get through and you're just going to try to qualify them. Are they ready? Is this going to be part of my five movements this month? And I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying it just doesn't. Actually, I'm saying we're all wrong if we take that attitude. So let's change that. So, okay, I went too fast. So let's, um, let's dive into empathy, right? Because this is a subject that's fascinating to me. And um, I've done a lot of reading. We've done a lot of reading at Sherpa. And a lot of what I'm going to say uh, comes out of um, reading about practical empathy, studying it. Um, there's a book by Indy Young called Practical Empathy, because we wanted to understand how do we put this thing to practice and what is empathy really? Empathy is not um, having, having empathy doesn't mean that you're all touchy feely at all, and I hope that was clear by what, what Casey was saying. Empathy is actually a noun. Empathy means to understand someone else's deep thinking, their thoughts, their feelings, and their values, to really understand someone else. Empathizing now is an action. Empathizing is a skill that we can teach ourselves and we can teach our teams and we can, you know, and 
and we can we can use in our personal lives and most certainly in our professional lives and it's an action meaning understanding it's a willingness to take the time to actually know another person's thinking feeling and values developing empathy is different than applying empathy so we all will be well served to develop empathy i really need it i'm a terrible listener because i just want to listen for my expertise and where can i just like come in with my opinion and what i think about that subject and i have something to add and i think i'm you know empathic i am not alex fisher needs to be more empathic i've told myself that because i think it's true and it's hard and we can learn this together developing empathy means developing the listening skill and we're going to dive into listening applying empathy is now that you have listened empathically now you know now you apply that in the context of what we do every day now you apply that empathy that understanding that understanding of someone else through your planning through your journaling through the next step based on that understanding. Now your next step, your journaling, your uh, prospect planning sessions are gonna be so much more powerful because you've developed empathy through developing your listening skills. Okay, is much easier said than done. The first and most important foundational um, thing, is trust. People will not tell you how they think, how they feel deeply, unless they trust you. So trust is many, many different, um, there are many different definitions, but it's an emotion that people feel that describe how a person feels about your authenticity and your honesty. Your authenticity, your honesty, your willingness, to give someone space. I think of trust as like, I'm gonna put a blanket in front of or in between us for you to lay down, for you to rest, for you to be you. And I'm gonna stay out of the way. It's providing that space for people. Who does that for you? Who provides that space for you to just talk and, and, and get your thoughts out and just, you know, because people, resolve their own ambivalence we don't resolve people's ambivalence we don't do any of that we're just facilitating a process in which a person can de-stress can feel free uncomfortable talking about all of their issues all of their thinking all of their emotions without that judgment and that's how we you've had the experience of having a friend listen to you and you have a problem and you're talking it through and you're finally figuring it out in your own head because no one can figure it out for you. There is a room, there is a place for when someone says, okay, now I need advice because now I've clarified what advice I need after I figured out what my thinking is because you've helped me by listening. So, the number one, um, I think that's very useful, and we talked a lot about setting intentions foundationally, is before you engage in a conversation with a prospective resident or a family member, it doesn't matter who, a person, state your intention. I am here for her, is what you think. I'm here for this person. And I'm really extremely curious about how this person thinks and feels. Not how I think and feel, not what I think they might be thinking and feeling, not looking for information, trying to figure out how does that fit in my model of the big assumption I make about all of prospects. They're all the same. They're all, you know, we have them all categorized in our own heads. We have so many assumptions about the people that we serve that we've stopped listening. So my intention as you come in and how you express it to that person, it's up to you, but be real, be authentic. I just wanna have a conversation. I really want to understand 
you know, what's going on, what's in your, what's on your mind. I would love to be able to understand you better. And um, this is, for most people, it's a difficult decision. I don't know what it's like for you. Would it be okay to just start talking? And this already creates, first of all, in your own mind, it sets you off by, it sets you up to, to have this kind of conversation because you've told yourself what you needed to do. And then the prospective buyer will say, wow, she's really trying to understand who doesn't want to be able to be listened to and talk out loud. So here's the problem. We're all very, we have a lot of expertise about our community. Um, and so we think that we need to focus on showing, on touring, on showing how much we know about our community, in showing how much we know about the industry, how knowledgeable we are. Who cares? I mean, they care about how much you know, but um, they care more importantly about how much you care about them. So. This is very difficult to do because to leave that um, that expert mind to have the child curiosity mind to be open to what you don't know is for us and for our brain extremely disconcerting and it's difficult but you can do it and this will take a few months of practice so imagine instead of being focused on showing you how much you know i'm focused on learning what you know how you think what you believe and that's the empath. Um, so here's an analogy that I use. I love analogies, uh, which is now you're engaging. I'm talking only now about listening, about developing empathy. And you can't do that without listening. So I'm talking about developing empathy. And I want to put it in the context of what we do every day. So imagine most sales and salespeople the prospect gets in the car and we're driving and we're showing them around. Oh, here's, we have this, we have that. And this is where people uh, have coffee and this is our new bistro and this is, okay. We're driving and we're going in the direction that we want and we're leading the person, you know, to where we want to go. If you want to engage in an empathic process, let the speaker choose, keep choosing the direction of the conversation. Take a tour of your prospect before the prospect tours you. Take a tour of the person, their feelings, their thought processes, their beliefs. This doesn't take forever, but it does take a concerted effort and it's very difficult to do, especially when we it's so ingrained in us that we're the tour givers, that we are the qualifiers of the leads that we're supposed to be experts at delivering information and being warm and kind and sympathetic and make and hoping and praying that this person is going to choose us because we're so nice so the empath takes the tour of the person let the prospect drive which is completely antithetical to what most salespeople will say, you be in control. No, give control to the person. That person is, is, is out of control. Most of our prospective residents or people out there or their adult children are so out of control. They don't know what's up. They're so ambivalent about whether or not they should do this. There's so many emotions and you know this. So what shall we do to de <laughs> to deconstruct that, listen, make that person feel known, feel understood by understanding them, not just make them feel understood, actually understand them. So how do we cut that off? The minute that you engage in a conversation, which used to be called discovery, now I hate that word, developing understanding of your prospect, of your market, of your lead base. The minute that someone shares something with you, like, you know, I had to stop driving. You're thinking, is it time to tell her about the van now? See, you're thinking, 
you're preparing your response you're looking for hot buttons so that you can sell the minute you do that the empathic process is gone something else is going to happen it's going to increase resistance um probably you're not going to get an advance because if that person is in ambivalence and needs to sort out their own thinking by you offering the van you've just cut off trust it's like ah see she's pretending to really want to know about me but really she's looking for clues so that she can tell me about the van and the restaurant and we have we have we have and this is something that we need to try to get out of our general practice um we're gonna do so much better and we're gonna have so much more fun so here's some tips this is probably the hardest stay away from offering advice i, I am now talking about getting to know and understand your prospects there is going to be the applying empathy that's step two in which now with that knowledge you can devise a strategy with your team about what to do next what the next step is so i'm not talking about you should never give advice but only when it's right only when you know what advice they seek and more importantly only when they know what advice they seek so it is her mind you're exploring the adult child the prospect themselves not you're not exploring when you're doing this empathic listening you're not exploring their understanding of your offering at all again you want to distress them you want to take the stress out of their brain so that they can make better decisions for themselves you're facilitating that become an expert at curiosity just be a kid you know you know those kids that are constantly asking questions it's so hard for us because you know we want to demonstrate that we're we're capable immediately we want to demonstrate that and people don't care so much about that we they want i think what people really want is for them for you to demonstrate that you truly care about them by the way that you engage by, by how curious you are about them curiosity is very difficult it's been beat out of us in our schooling as i mentioned before it's about what we know in standardized testings. It's not about what great questions we ask. It's always about how much we know the lesson. It's been institutionalized in us. So when you're engaging in these deep conversations, when you are developing empathy, meaning developing understanding of your prospect, don't do any analysis in your own head about what's being said at the moment, because that's going to not allow you to stay present and stay in the listening mode in the being in absorbing and drinking it in analysis and strategy i can guarantee you comes later and here's two things should i take notes when someone's talking no i mean there's all kinds of different reasons why you may have to if this is a part of the conversation in which you're um, jotting down things that are important to the person but in an empathic getting to know that person's thinking and feeling conversation please don't take notes even if you're not in person and you're on the phone if you're taking notes you're already off your off your game because you're not focused you're analyzing what's being said as it's being said drink it in and then later go do your journaling the reason that we put all these different um areas in 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 our crm about you know put in what you've learned about the person is because now it's time for you to do your analysis but not when you're present with that person and we trend, try to do it all at once because we don't have any time we have so many leads so no analysis during the conversation that will come later rest assured that you'll remember you'll remember the important things if you were actually listening deeply if you were distracted with your own thoughts which brings me to tip number whatever this number is do a little meditation get to know how your mind works you are very stressed you have your regional you know we need the movements we need the movements that's very stressful 
you um, examine your own biases, examine when you're making assumptions about a person, actually play a little game and we're outside when you're in a social situation, although that's not happening very much. But even when you're at Starbucks and you see other people, just think about how much you judge and assume about people just by looking at them. And every time you do that, give yourself a little point and say, ah, because this is becoming you becoming aware of how you think, how you judge. We all have to. We all judge. We all make assumptions. You know, we do shortcuts because we have to move through the world. So once you become aware, and by the way, that's emotional intelligence, empathy, self-awareness, and then self-regulation, which means I'm aware right now that I want to jump in with a solution. I'm aware right now that I'm making an assumption. And now I regulate that by putting that aside. But recognize it because if you don't recognize it, then it'll 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 be there by default. So developing emotional energy, uh, empathy, developing empathic skills, uh, empathizing skills is going to <laughs> require that you become really good at recognizing and knowing yourself, know thyself in order to know others. I have no idea how time is going. Okay, we have a little time. Okay, here's the I thing. Try to avoid saying I, 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 I say it all the time. I think I know how you feel. My mom also moved in and when I did this, so try to use you in the example that um, in the conversation. So in the example that Casey gave, he talked about, it sounds like you are struggling with that instead of, I think what I hear is that you're struggling with that. See how subtle it is? It's, su it's super subtle and we do it by default, we use I. So this is gonna take months. This is gonna take a lot of practice, but you have a lot of people to practice, practice with that are there waiting for you to, to call them and be listened to. So lots of I instead of you. <sighs> stay calm, stay serene, stay interested, be present. That's again, take, take some deep breaths before you go into a phone call or a tour. Suspend that judgment and assumptions and use all of your brain power because you're super smart to pay attention, to be present. Um, lots of practice. This is gonna require lots of practice. I have some, um, have some post-it notes. Okay. What are you listening to? What are you interested in? There's three things really, there's more than three things. You can talk about, so what did you do for a living and what was your life like? And we can do that and get into a relationship in which we know every detail of their past, that's not gonna help them resolve ambivalence. I used to think that if we had an understanding of that person's whole biography and whole story, then that person was going to feel so close to us that they were going to say, yeah, I'm going to leave my home. You know, that doesn't work. What I'd like to talk about and what I'd like to uh, explore together with all of you is how do we get to resolving ambivalence quicker so that we don't have the, you know, hours and hours spent just learning things that are not helping that person resolve their ambivalence. So the reason that we want to hear the story is because we want to listen for their values. Was that person a volunteer? Was that, we want to, we want to understand what people value and what they valued in their lives and then compare that after you did the listening, when you do your own analysis, compare that with how they're living today. I was a missionary in Africa you know, we volunteered in church. We were so involved in church. It's not happening now. Use your own analytic skills after you've drunk it in and listen for the themes and values. Then we're also listening for in our listening sessions when we're developing empathy for emotion. Emotion is, is, is information. Emotion is data. Um, tells us... Um, how we feel about something and it gives us clue about how resistant 
or how difficult something may or may not be. And we can't change people's emotions, but recognizing them and don't say, I know how you feel or how do you feel about that as much. Try to go for, tell me more about your thinking. People feel a bit more serene and their brains are a little bit more engaged when you explore someone's thinking. And then finally, you're, used, you're looking for values and, um, and motivations. Values, motivations, deep, deep thinking and beliefs, and then emotions. This sounds a lot like therapy. I don't know about you, but in so many years that I've met with prospective residents and families, I was exhausted and I felt I was being a therapist and a financial advisor and all these things. Um, what I've learned now is that if we truly engage in becoming skilled at empathizing and listening, the prospective buyer is going to do all the work. We're just going to have to facilitate that because they have to make the decision. They have to go through all of that. And if we remove the pressure and remove the, the resistance, that person is going to be able to think more clearly and feel like, oh, at this place, at Shady Pan, at Community B, these people really listened. They really understand me. So last one, use the fewest number. Now we're talking again about listening sessions and I'm gonna call them listening sessions for a second so that our brain can get ready to listen. Use the fewest number of words and questions. Don't prepare your next question. Again, let the person drive. Tell me more about that. What's on your mind? Can you explain more? I'm not sure I understand. And that's only if you're not sure you understand. Because when someone tells you something, you will make a judgment or an assumption. But if you... If you train yourself to say, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe that's just how I feel about it. Tell me more. So engaging in that curiosity and in that conversation and helping those people, those, those people that you're talking to lead the way will take you to such a deep understanding of what that person is thinking and feeling and what they value that your job, you're going to be so much more effective at producing and helping that person change and ultimately make a decision. And if you were the one doing that, they're gonna move in with you. I have to say one last thing, pick 10 people and engage in 10 listening sessions. The ones that have told you they weren't ready and call me next month or the ones that are in the bulk mail thing, just pick 10 people and go practice, see what happens. Did I leave no time for questions? Sorry, Tim. <laughs> no, no worries. I think uh, we've got a couple, we've got two minutes here. So we probably only have time for one question. We got a question while you were talking. So really quickly, the question was, would you please talk more about what you mean by motivations? Oh, why would you want to leave your home of 25 years? Not because I had a fall, that's not a motivation. Not because I have diabetes, that's not a motivation. We confuse triggers with motivators. Motivators are usually pretty deep and it has to do with this isn't working for me. Why isn't it working for you? We are very, very bad at finding motivators. Why wouldn't you want to leave? Why wouldn't you stay at home? And that's when you get motivators, when you ask why move? We never ask that question because we're worried about convincing people to stay home. That makes sense to me. Uh, while you were talking also a lot of that advice, I think doubles for advice for journalists too. I've heard some of that in my line of, of work as well. So this is universal advice, I think, for all people. It really is, it really is. But imagine if we can apply it to our work, collaborating within our teams and then talking to our market, to our potential residents in this way, listening. Um, I think it's a game changer and I think it's gonna require lots of skill building and 
it's going to be our mission this year um, to really incorporate that in our in our language and in our training and in our skill development. Great. Well, Alex, thank you so much for, for walking us through all of this. Um, and, and thanks for bringing Casey on earlier. He was great. We got a lot of good comments about, about the stuff that he was sharing. I think people are really engaged. So this has been a great discussion. And also just thank you to Sherpa uh, for making this possible. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to tell our audience, uh, we'll be back in about 15 minutes. You'll see my face again. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, uh, but for now, um, thanks for watching and we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye everyone. Y'all stay heroic.